Welcome to PID. We are going to begin our webinar of some of the best economists in the world. We do a lot of webinars deliberately to communicate to our people the best and latest that's happening in the world. Today, I'm delighted to have Rosie Collington. Rosie Collington has just finished a book with Mariana Amazukato. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Rosie. Please correct me if I'm not. Mariana Mazzucotto has done two or three very good books that have shaken up the economics world. And the latest one, The Big Con, is extremely interesting, very interesting book. Um, Rosie, your book really resonates with me and many of us in Pakistan because we, we suffer from The Big Con in a, a big way, in a much bigger way than you can imagine. And we'll get to that. But before I do that, let me just introduce Rosie Collington. Rosie Collington is a well-known um, thinker, writer. Um, she's just she's finished a degree from University College in London, Mariana Mazzucato. And she's written this very nice book, The Big Con, which is, I won't go into details on that. I really enjoyed it, but it's something that all of you must read. It's the subtitle is How the Big, How the Consulting Industry Weakens Our Businesses, Infantilizes Emphasis on infantilizes our governments and warps our economies. Well, as I said, Rosie, we've suffered from it. So thank you very much for writing this book. I think the whole of Pakistan should thank you. Um, but I will not go deeper into the book. I will let you tell it to us. Just for your information, Rosie, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics is a very old think tank. It's the largest think tank in Pakistan. It leads the network of Pakistani universities and uh, sets the development policy agenda for Pakistan. So you're talking to a very good crowd. Um, over to you, Rosie. I'll let you describe your work and not try and describe it for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is a huge honor to be speaking with you today. Um, I'm, of course, familiar with the work of the think tank and the institute and, uh, and uh, the esteemed colleagues who you have hosted before so it really means a lot to me to be here so thank you all very much I just wanted to check first that everyone can hear me um so so my name is Rosie Collington as, as you've just heard I'm one of the co-authors with my PhD supervisor Mariana Matsukato of the Big Con how the consulting industry weakens our businesses infantilizes our governments and warps our economies so the subtitle really captures what we are arguing in the book or what we or the conclusions that we came to during the research um, underpinning this book um, so I'm going to begin because many people when, when I've been giving presentations before many people um, I've learned are very interested in, in how we got to thinking and writing uh, uh, the big con in the first place so what was it about our work or what research were we doing that helped to um, kind of uh, uh, instigate or shape the the kind of premise of this work in the first place. Um, so I'm a graduate of two political science degrees, as I imagine many other people might be in this room. And um, I would also be very interested, I, I will say, uh, perhaps during the q and I'd be very interested to learn more about the involvement of consultancies in Pakistan and, and, and in kind of government authorities and in the private sector. I have been trying to read um, about, about cases in Pakistan today and, and this past week, but um, it would perhaps be good to hear how much these arguments that we make resonate with you. But so for me, I graduated from two political science degrees and I became very interested in why so many of my colleagues, so many of my classmates were going straight in to work in these consultancies um, as, as soon as they finished uh, school. And perhaps this is, we know this is a similar phenomenon in many parts of the world um, that consulting graduate schemes have become the graduate scheme par excellence is where many people want to go when they finish their studies. Um, so that was that was kind of one starting point. Another one was that I actually did spend some time working with uh, one of the big four companies when I was working for a very large organization in London before I uh, started my 
PhD before I started my master's in fact um, and so I spent some time on secondment in one of the big four companies um, and so many of the issues that we explore further in the book I began thinking about then. Um, for Mariana's part of course Mariana has um, served as an advisor and has has been um, at kind of top levels of policy making now for, for, for the good part of a decade. And she became increasingly interested again in why so many um, graduates were often at the decision making tables where she was. So we, we, we kind of encountered, for both of us, we encountered this phenomenon, consultancies, um, through professional, through policy work, um, but of but of course that is not enough to, uh, you know, our, our experiences were not enough to really shape our understanding of this of this world and of this industry. So as academics, we then um, began looking into more closely what this sector was constituted by, what the companies were, um, and crucially the, the size of it and where it was growing around the world. Um, and then the pandemic hit, of course, the global COVID-19 pandemic hit. And suddenly in Europe, and perhaps this was the case in Pakistan as well, but suddenly in Europe, consultancies were everywhere seemingly. Um, and they were also on the front pages of our newspapers. So we learned that the UK government, for example, what had, had given a huge contract to Deloitte although many other consultancies were contracted during the pandemic. Um, the contract that was given to Deloitte, or one of the big contracts that was given to Deloitte, was to help develop the UK's test and trace system. So this was our, um, uh, we had an app, the government developed an app um, uh, that, that was set up to kind of help monitor the spread of COVID-19 and generally to, and generally the programme was to monitor the spread of COVID-19. And at one point, Deloitte was earning £1 million per day from uh, its contracts. A subsequent inquiry by the Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee, which scrutinises public spending and public finances, concluded that this programme had been overly reliant on expensive contractors and temporary staff. Um, it also found that the junior consultants that were brought in, and there were many junior consultants on the ground um, uh, during this programme, rarely had specialist expertise in the relevant area. And it also concluded that test and trace has not achieved its main objective to help break chains of COVID-19 transmission and enable people to return to a more normal way of life. So, of course, this, this case was, uh, as, as we were both living in the UK, this, this case became very interesting to us, also because it raises the question of, you know, would this have failed um, uh, if the government had done it itself? And if it had, what, were, what, what could the consequences have been? Or to what extent were the problems that arose within this contract um, actually an issue with the way the government was using consultancies? Um, the UK was not alone. Um, Macron in France was ha uh, has also been at the at the centre of what has become known as le scandale McKinsey, which um, uh, followed again the French government's use of consultancies during its vaccination rollout in the country, um, it, where, where many countries in Europe had were able to. Uh, introduce vaccines uh, and, and get them into the arms of their citizens within a fairly short amount of time. And all the data was suggesting that France was lagging very far behind. Um, and then members of the French government began um, looking into which organisations, which actors were involved in managing this. And they found that a lot of money was being spent again on the consulting companies. And McKinsey in particular was at the helm of the vaccine um, rollout program. Um, so this then led to a big inquiry that was looking at how much the, the government was spending, led by the French Senate, um, and uh, ultimately, they published a report that found that central government ministries had spent almost 900 million euros on management consulting fees in 2021. So just to put that into context, context that was double what had been spent in, tw in 2018. 
Um, and they found a number of cases where seemingly money was spent, but very little was provided in exchange. So, for example, a contract with Boston Consulting Group and Ernst & Young to organise a convention for public se sector officials that never took place. So this, this also raises some kind of red flags around public spending. Also in 2021, you know, another big scandal kind of hit hit the headline this time in Australia, where um, McKinsey had been contracted to help develop the long term emissions reduction plan um, for Australia. Um, but the models that McKinsey used assumed no no increase in clean energy and were generally just hugely criticised by climate analysts globally. Um, and, and in fact, um, Australia's net zero uh, or, or national net zero strategy was ranked last out of 60 countries during the conference of parties um, that took place in Glasgow that year. Um, other analysts and commentators also started to point to the fact that while McKinsey was advising the Australian government and many other governments um, on their net zero strategies, on their climate strategies, it was also advising or had also advised at least 43 of the 100 biggest polluters. So this raises some issues around conflicts of interest. Um, the now uh, Minister for, the, for Climate Change and Energy, who was then the shadow minister for climate change and energy um, described the report as a scam flaw on net zero, which was quite interesting. So the, all this is to say is that the list of scandals that we have become aware of through um, kind of journalistic investigations, through new, newspaper reporting in Europe and in America, and presumably also in Pakistan. I know also there has been big scrutiny um, in, in, in India around the use of consultancies and around the use of um, consultancies in government. Um, all this is to say is that the list of these kind of headline grabbing scandals seems to be growing every day. So um, Bain and Company has been linked to corruption in South Africa. Um, there, there were issues with the way that auditing companies have been involved in um, uh, uh, helping to, or, or the auditing function, sorry, of consult of some consulting function of some consulting companies have been um, ha have kind of failed in the collapse of very big companies. Um, and in Puerto Rico, for example, there has been what was described as an, an unprecedented evasion of disclosure rules in McKinsey's advice, the advice that it was giving to the government. Um, these kind of headline grabbing scandals and the kind of brilliant investigative journalism stories about them have been captured also in some recent books, including uh, When McKinsey Comes to Town and The Infiltrators, which, is a, which looks at the French case um, in particular. But as a political economist, of course, Marianne is an economist, we're very interested as political scientists, we're very interested in what, the, what do these scandals or what might these scandals tell us about the kind of bigger systemic issues in our economies, if anything. Um, so in the big con and in the research that was underpinning the big con, we were very interested in, in looking at what happens kind of beneath the surface, if you like, of these of these big scandals um, and to explore to what extent they are manifestations or symptoms of broader crises in capitalism. Um, so we wanted to ask, why do so many governments outsource critical activities to consulting companies? That's kind of the big question. We, so we began we began the research for the book with these kind of core five questions. Why do so many governments outsource critical activities to consulting companies? Why has the market for consulting companies grown so much in recent decades and globally? Um, what do consultants do and what role does the consulting industry play in the economy overall? Why do so many well-meaning and smart graduates choose to work for these companies? And what might this tell us about contemporary capitalism, if anything? So to get started, um, the book focuses on, on the big four and the big three. These are the terms that are used in the industry and in academia to describe um, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, KPMG and PwC, which are consulting companies that historically have their roots in accounting, um, but actually de uh, derive more revenue from consulting services and consulting, of course, has much bigger um, kind of profit margins, is much more profitable than, than auditing. Um, and also the big three, which are generally referred to or generally understood to be strategy consultancies. Um, and that's Bain and Company, McKinsey and Company and Boston Consulting Group. These companies are um, 
globally um, uh, are, are globally uh, very significant. They have um, offices in almost every country and, and certainly in every region of the world. They're not the only companies that we look at in the book, but they are the focus of the book. Um, they're not the only companies because the tendencies that has given rise to these companies um, we also find having been very influential and important for the growth of other companies. So we do touch on, you know, for example, Tata consultancies in India, which some, some of you may be familiar with because I know it's very big in, in the region, not just in India. Um, but uh, so, so strategy companies uh, are, are those that have their origins in the 1900s to 1930s and the kind of growth of ideas around Taylorism, scientific management and cost accounting. Um, again, the accounting companies, which really grew in the 60s and 70s. We also touch on IT consultancies, which um, I imagine are also very big in Pakistan. Um, and these kind of grow, grew with the computerization and the need for connectivity or the perceived need for connectivity through firm growth in the private sector. And examples of them would be Capgemini, Cognizant, Oracle, CGI Group. Um, other types of companies that we look at in the book are what we describe as outsourcing or public sector service, public services consultancies. Um, and these have really grown particularly in Europe as governments from around the 1990s increased their the outsourcing of public services that they were offering. Um, and so that would include uh, companies in Europe like Serco, Sodexo, Atos and Falk. Now we've also seen the growth of what are described in the literature and what describe themselves as boutique consultancies. So these are essentially smaller companies um, that offer more specialized services perhaps, or they might have a kind of more local focus than the big global multinationals. Um, and they've really grown um, because of the, the, the wider growth. We can track their growth um, in the growth uh, in opportunities for management consulting more widely. So this is just to say that the quest, the, the, the question, as soon as you start to look at the consulting industry, that the question becomes well, what, what is a consultancy, right? We can also look at the work that many academics do, that think tanks do, that we do even at my research institute, as in some way constituting a form of consulting insofar as we're often providing advice, right? Academics, when they publish research, um, are providing a form of advice when they're working with governments, um, when they're working with, labor organizations they may be providing a form of advice but we, we focus in in the book on the companies that have as their kind of structural uh, uh, uh imperative as their business model the need to continue securing contracts for advisory services so this is quite different to what happens in academia um and it also means that we are not focusing on companies that have an advisory arm, but that is not kind of a core operation of the company. So that would include, for example, BlackRock, which is um, uh, uh, which has a, 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 a financial advisory arm, um, but but it's relatively small, um, or it's small relative to the kind of uh, size of their core services and or their core offering in financial services. The main uh, question that we get asked is, well, how big is this sector? And that was, you know, what we were very interested in. And the the thing that we're very upfront about in the book, the, the thing that you'll read about first is how difficult it is and has been to estimate the growth of the consulting industry globally. So unlike in publicly traded multinational companies, management consultancies operate as private companies. Um, and, and also, so they ha have either kind of forms of limited private um, companies, um, but all, but also they're part of a kind of global network of private companies. So it can be very difficult because they are not mandated to disclose revenue. They're not mandated to disclose where they make their revenue. It can be very difficult to estimate accurately what the size of the sector is. The best estimates that we could get were um, uh, well exactly what we found in 
um, uh, 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 kind of market market research companies, um, which other academics have also used. I think these are these are the most accurate, but 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 they're no means particularly accurate, and I think they're probably a bit conservative. Um, but all accounts suggest that the consulting industry has gl grown massively over the past few decades. So just to put that into perspective, globally in 1999, management consulting revenues were estimated to be somewhere between 100 to 110 billion dollars, and today or in 2021, it ranged from almost 700 to $900 billion. Um, so that, and there are some uh, kind of suggestions that the market is beginning to slow a little bit in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw a kind of big increase in demand for services. But this will still be a huge growth. This will still constitute a big growth uh, relative to the past few years, well, relative to the past few decades. So. I will give a kind of brief overview of the book. I think that's probably the easiest or, or, or the best thing to do for for for, um, for, for now. Sometimes, uh, or if we have time, I will go into a, a little bit more of the specifics of what we mean when we when we talk about the infantilization of government and come at this from a kind of more academic, theoretical perspective. As I know, most people in the room will uh, kind of not be alarmed by some of that. But I will also try to give an overview of, of what we discuss in the book. Um, so we discuss the roots of modern consulting, the roots of these big consultancy companies that we focus on, um, which really emerged in uh, North America and Europe at the end of the second industrial revolution with the emergence of consultant engineers like Arthur D. Little, independent consultants, um, uh, so who, who were not organized kind of as companies then came to spread these new business ideas across North America and Europe. Um, and it was crucially, this is something that the historian Christopher D. McKenna has written extensively about. It was regulatory changes in the United States um, that inadvertently created opportunities for cost accounting firms such as McKinsey and Company to spread from the 1930s because these companies were no or, or companies that provided auditing services were no longer allowed to provide uh, management advice to companies which they previously had done and this kind of separation that was introduced or this uh, this legal separation that was introduced as part of the Glass-Steagall Act then created opportunities for companies that did not offer auditing services to grow into the management advice um uh, market that auditing companies previously had done um in europe and north america it was the kind of military expansions during world war ii welfare state developments and the growth of multi-divisional firms across europe that really helped to fuel demand for consulting companies um in the book we also look at the role that consulting firms played in help or have played historically and still continue to play um in helping to disperse labor labor conflicts within companies um, and that's something that we think probably requires more research something that we touch on in the book but we, we identified it as a gap in the literature and we were able to do um uh, interviews with representatives from um uh, uh, trade union and trade union federations but again this is something that it has not been um, kind of research particularly well. Um, and again, because we we do focus, or we, we begin this story, we tell this story from the perspective of um, Europe and North America, because these companies really, that are now globally dominant, really emerged in Europe and North America. Um, but I'll get to kind of how they have grown around the world, how they have spread around the world imminently. Um, in Europe and North America, we have this narrative that the growth of these consulting companies in government in particular was really triggered by um, Margaret Thatcher and the rise of neoliberal policies. Um, uh, and, and that's true. So we, we include the statistic that under Thatcher, spending on consulting services went from six million pounds a year in 1979 to 246 million pounds a year in 1990. Um, but crucially, particularly in the UK and in many governments that adopted what we understand as kind of a third way paradigm that shaped their reform agendas, um, it was during these decades, the 1990s and the 2000s, that the use of management consultancies in the public sector really grew and became entrenched um so yeah a, a, an example of this that we've discussed in the book was how consultancies helped to um 
help to both promote and implement the use of the private finance initiative, which is now used globally um, as, a, as, a, as a form of public private partnership. Um, uh, 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 and, uh, and, and it has become very expensive in the, in the long term for governments. Um, but we do also look, even though these companies um, that are now globally dominant have their origins in North America and Europe, we do, of course, also look at how and why they have spread globally. Why, for example, even though the biggest markets for these services continue to be in North America and Europe, the fastest growing markets for these services are in, um, for example, Gulf countries, in African countries, and also in parts of Asia. Um, and and, and uh, that, that's, that's very important. That's something that has been true for the past couple of years. And I think in all of these countries, we are likely to see um, kind of much faster growth if, if, uh, if we don't kind of put some reins on it in, in the um, coming years as well. Um, but we can we can really trace the growth of consultancies in uh, many countries to the um, years of the 1980s and many countries around the world were facing sovereign default and turned to the IMF and the World Bank for loans. Um, as a condition of these loans, as, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that no one, no one in this uh, seminar needs me to explain what what structural adjustment programs um, were. But as one of the conditions, I guess what might be surprising to some people is that on the advice of these lenders, and often as mandated, or sometimes as mandated, as part of a structural adjustment program, governments contracted management consultants to design and manage the implementation of structural adjustment programs. So for example, in Mexico, where it was mandated that the banking system had to be, or, or the public banks had to be privatized, consultancies were brought in to evaluate which banks should be privatized in Mexico. We also look at we look at contracts. We went into the um, digital archives of the World Bank, and you can take a look at some of the contracts for structural adjustment programs at this time. And in the um, kind of terms of the contracts, sometimes you see um, that there was a mandate for uh, a private consulting company essentially to be brought in to oversee or supervise the process of structural adjustment. Um, which is quite, uh, is, is, is very interesting. And I, I would say that academically very interesting and, and also very alarming. Um, uh, with, the, with the fall of the Soviet Union, consultancies also um, spread to new markets. Um, and we discussed that in the book. What we, why, we begin the book, we begin the kind of, core analysis of the book with this discussion of um, consultancies and the growth of consultancies in relation to these broader transformations in global capitalism, really because we want to show that the growth of consulting companies and what we're calling the big con or this big confidence trick is not just a factor of the things that the companies are doing. It's not just the, the it, it, it's not just the consultancies, this is also to do with how governments um, intergovernmental organizations and businesses are using consultancies. So these transformations that we've seen have fueled demand for these services, have helped to create a market. And part of why that happens as well as in, in government in particular is because we have these ideas, these ideas that government is not innovative, that government should get out of the way as much as possible, that markets are best placed to find solutions. These ideas that have become dominant in many countries and many econ economies around the world have also lent um, some kind of legitimacy to, to the use of consultancies in government. Um, but at the same time, while we have tried to emphasize that this is a kind of systemic issue, the, the growth in consulting is a systemic issue, the big confidence trick is a systemic issue, um, there are things that companies do to help create um, a perception that they are creating value for citizens and for clients and for their economies, even if this is not true. So we question, we question this idea that consultancies, that the consulting industry exists on the scale and scope that it does today because it creates value for clients. This is, of course, what the consulting sector itself will say, and it's also what a lot of the academic literature will say. 
but we we look at how it invests heavily in creating the perception of value and this is something that other academics have written about as well um and and it does this for example through recruiting from these kind of globally elite schools and, and nationally elite universities as well um and and historically, this is something, again, the historian Christopher D. McKenna has written about in the 20th century, when unlike in the legal profession or in the auditing profession, which are protected professions, um, that where, where they have kind of strict rules uh, uh, um, regulating the profession, unlike in this profession, management consulting is not protected in any way. There are some kind of standards domestically, but essentially anyone can call themselves a management consultant and so it has become very important for the sector to create legitimacy or try to create a sense of legitimacy in other ways um, and recruiting from these elite schools has been one way that they have done that um, of course um, some of you might be familiar with some of the reports and things that come out of the consultancies the way that um, kind of the kind of standard templates for um, creating PowerPoint slide decks um, has become almost a trope in how we think about the way that consultancies operate in the world. Um, but this is to say, even though we don't kind of focus too much on this in the book, this is one of the ways, again, that consultancies help to create um, legitimacy. We focus a little bit more in the book on how they have um, invested in what we are calling quasi academic research institutions. So, um, so for example, a number of the um, big consultancies have developed or have set up what are nominally called universities. So for example, Capgemini University or Deloitte University, um, which are kind of training centers for their employees, which do not offer degree programs, um, but are one way that they help to kind of create a sense that what they are offering is academic or intellectually and uh, robust. Um, and of course, you know, McKinsey Global Institute, for example, does recruit, they do also recruit very intelligent people with top kind of academic qualifications. Um, and one thing that McKinsey Global Institute does is produce these reports, which, you know, for academics can be very useful and certainly for many people in industry can be very useful and, in and interesting. So it's worth interrogating then um, what function these reports play. And it's, ve it's very interesting that often these reports also play a, a marketing function. They help to establish a consultancy as a thought leader in a particular area and again create the impression that the kind of expertise that is captured in this report is representative of the expertise that will be on the ground in companies um, when they are contracting the consulting company. And of course, we know that, you know, the, the kind of graduates who are often the people who are the foot soldiers of the company, who are the ones working in, in, in companies, um, do not have the expertise that um, underpins the, the report. And we challenge the kind of assumptions about knowledge and how knowledge is created, how uh, to what extent the, the knowledge that might be valuable for companies can be codified or if much of it is in fact tacit. Um, we challenge this as also a kind of core issue with the uh, with the sector. One of the kind of core arguments that we that we make in the book is that we can understand the consulting the ways that the consulting industry uh, derives its income and earns its income as a form of rent extraction um, and, and the, the argument underpinning this kind of comes in two parts the first is that the value of the contracts is often high and the risks that the consultancies assume relevant relative to the potential rewards are low um, but crucially what the, conf the the big confidence trick and the investment of resources in creating the perception that these are um, objective sources of expertise and capacity has done is provided these companies with an almost unique position in our economies, an almost monopolistic position um, as objective brokers of, of expertise. And that's why we can understand how they derive um, income as a, as a form of um, economic rent. So this this is where we get, I guess, to the consequences of um, the, the growth in the use of consulting companies at scale and scope. And I'll get to why the scale and scope part is important here. Um, the term infantilized, which you picked up on earlier, um, is very is a fantastic term. Unfortunately, we did not come up with it ourselves. It was something that um, uh, a conservative uh, 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 minister 
um, who is a member of the House of Lords, said when in a letter that was leaked to the Guardian about what had happened to the public sector in the UK during the pandemic. So uh, Lord Agnew argued that Whitehall had been infantilized by an unacceptable reliance on expensive management consultants. Um, and so this term really captures what happens to, uh, to organizations when they become over dependent on um, external sources of capacity instead of investing internally. I'm not going to spend too much time going into the kind of mechanics of this, um, but this is also something that I'm investigating further, the kind of act actual um, dynamics of this process I'm investigating further in my um, PhD. Um, but essentially, it's the tension between two views of two, two economic perspectives that the kind of theory underpinning the use of consultants um, can be captured in transaction cost economics, which is this idea that the effects of outsourcing are confined to the process of the transaction itself, um, which is measured in terms of potential immediate cost savings and flexibility to change the scale of productive capacity in response to demand fluctuations. Yeah, okay, and, and this, this um, approach though fails to recognize the systemic consequences of this short-term perspective, um, this kind of exchange-based perspective or neoclassical exchange-based perspective of, of outsourcing um, that can result dynamically from the transaction that is, is the focus. So instead, we kind of expand our lens. And of course, if you're familiar with Mariana's work, you know she's an innovation economist. Um, she's done a kind of, of and published fantastic work in um, evolutionary, uh, using evolutionary economic theory. Um, and so we we draw on some of these theories to try to under, to try to under, apply this to the public sector and to understand how learning might be undermined. This process of learning within organisations might be under, undermined when consultancies are used at scale and scope. Um, and this this approach explores the relationship, not just the kind of cost. Um, benefit that the immediate cost benefit of of the the decision to contract out, but it seeks to open what we describe as the black box of production um, by exploring the relationship between routine strategic selectivity, search, and adaptation within the firm. I'm not going to spend too much time on this now, but as you can see, there is um, uh, some kind of work that we're doing, or I've been doing on my PhD related to this, that looks at what the implications of outsourcing or agentification perhaps are. The, the in, which introduces new organizational boundaries between groups of routine, how this then affects the ability to kind of learn from those routines and what the consequences of that are over time. We also in the book um, discuss conflicting interests because it would have been, it's not, it's not something that we um, kind of have as a core focus in our, in, our res in our wider research, but it would have been remiss not to discuss conflicting interests in this sector, given, um, given that their biggest clients are in, um, for example, uh, that are in se sectors that are, that have historically sought to um, um, move away from or, 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 or find ways of navigating government regulation in ways that um, protect their bottom line. So we, we, we discuss a few different types of conflicting interests. So they could be direct. So for example, if the company directly benefits from the advice it gives to a client, and this is not necessarily in the client's best interest, but we also discuss systemic conflicts of interest. So if the advice creates change in a sector or policy that the consultancy then um, inadvertently benefits from. We, we, we discussed cases where consultancies have benefited from access to policy knowledge and information. So for example, where they have um, been contracted by governments to help develop tax legislation and then use that knowledge um, in their work with clients. Um, and again, this is something and I'm, I've realised that I've run over time a bit, so I'll be very quick. Um, this is something that um, we think is probably a bigger issue than is currently recognised in the academic literature, um, but that um, consultancies have been contracted to um, uh, kind of help legitim le legitimate decisions uh, that may undermine collective bargaining agreements in countries or in companies where these exist. In the book, we, we kind of look at all of these issues in relation to the sustainability consulting theme. So in the past couple of years, um, governments and businesses around the world have um, increasingly demanded services from the consulting sector. Um, and we try to explore in the book, unpack why this is um, and what consequences it might have for the re realization of 
um, kind of net zero or, or carbon neutrality by 2050 as the goal is. Okay, but the book is not all doom and gloom. Um, we do look at things that we try to, we have tried to rely as much as possible on things that governments and organizations and businesses around the world are doing to kind of um, uh, move away from some of the problems that we have ident identified in the book. You know, some of them we are not, with some of these problems, we're not the first people to kind of identify them. We maybe unpack the kind of dynamics in a way that hasn't been done before and situate it within kind of the broader global transformation of capitalism. But there are, but governments in particular have identified um, some of these things. Now, kind of in following with Mariana's wider work, we, we do argue that because the consult the growth of consulting and the or the growth of the consulting industry and the problems that it has given rise to are a systemic issue it re requires a systemic response it requires us to think more fundamentally about the role of government and also learning and organizations in our economies um so we this requires us to have an economy that finds better ways to know what people want and need that rewards action over speculation that embraces uncertainty so this is critical um uh, in the public sector often civil servants and politicians are doing what they can to avoid scrutiny from um the public for failures and this can be a reason why consultancies are brought in as a, as a kind of blame avoidance tactic but actually in many in many in many places of course with the right checks and balances and ensuring that it isn't happening at a kind of massive scale at a huge cost to public spending, um, risk taking in government may be a good thing. And even where there are failures in the implementation of projects, again, as long as this is happening at a sensible scale and not at, at kind of huge cost to the public purse, um, failure can be can become a source of capacity, a source of learning um, that enables government to kind of better address problems of the future. Um, and it, crucially, that recognizes value creation as a collective community process. Um, it requires governments to be able to, in particular, but, but also businesses, it requires governments to be able to focus, to be able to identify properly what capabilities they both need uh, when they genuinely need external sources of advice and what capabilities consultancies are able to offer and not fall for what was described during the Apollo mission in the United States, um, where there were big concerns about the use of consultancies as well, something Mariana has written about previously, um, and not fall for quote unquote brochuremanship or the kind of um, promises that may not be back backed up. It requires that when governments do work with other organizations that this is done with a common purpose um, and, and that governments find ways to ensure that the um, interests of these companies are properly aligned. Now, this might mean not working with companies that have disclosure uh, or that have conflicts of interest that the government cannot itself properly manage. Um, it might mean changing the types of contracts that they use from cost plus contracts, which can be gained to fix price with some incentives. Um, and uh, we also suggest it means probably having a no excess profit because it's not to say that um, organizations can, cannot, of course, um, earn revenue that enables them to exist, etc. But the kinds of profits that many of these companies, the profit margins that these companies are making on their consulting contracts, is probably in, in, in government antithetical to um, public services, uh, public interest often. Um, ultimately, all this requires, again, reconfiguring or rethinking what the role of government is um, and, and, and rebuilding capacity in government so, so that it's not only able to do things itself, but is able to manage contracts when it needs them. Um, one thing that we've been asked quite quite a bit during these talks, so I just added this extra slide today, is what, what potential there might be for in-house public sector consultancies. It's something that we talk about in the book. Um, so in Denmark, for example, um, the Danish government, which, you know, I guess outside of Denmark, you know, many of us think this is this kind of very successful capitalist state with a huge welfare system and um, all the rest of it. But it, but it, uh, the Danish government also recognised that it had been spending far too much on consultancies and it was having uh, the consequences for kind of capacity and learning and and, and was also very costly for the public purse and set up established an internal public sector consultancy in 2019 um 
Now, we, we suggest that these can be a valuable mechanism for both saving money. It, uh, the, the Danish kind of experiment in this has, has shown that they are spending less money than uh, on, on the in-house public sector consultancy than they were previously. And it can be a valuable mechanism for reshoring capabilities and preventing a capacity deficit when spending on external consultancies has been cut. So usually when a government moves away from consultancies, they introduce it in the form of a um, cut in spending on consultancies. Um, with, uh, but, but the risk of doing this, the risk of kind of having this goal is that where a government or where an organisation has become dependent on consultancies over time, that it then... Um, kind of has an immediate capacity deficit or capabilities deficit. So internal public sector consultancies can also be a way of ensuring that this doesn't happen as the government is seeking to rebuild its capabilities. Um, but so I'll, I'll leave it there. I think we have a bit of time for questions and answers. I can stay until quarter past. I think that's what we said. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time to, to listen to the presentation. I hope it was interesting and not too broad. I'm trying to capture as much of the book as I can um, in, in, in quite a short space of time for anyone who hasn't read it. Um, but thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoy it if you do read it. Thank you, Rosie. That was very kind, very good introduction, very nice summarizing of the book. Um, we're going to put it on a reading list, so rest assured we'll get a lot of people to read it because I think it's a very important book. Folks, please raise your hand quickly because Rosie has about roughly about 25 minutes before she has to go. So very quickly, Rosie, before I turn to the audience, I want to ask just two, a couple of questions. One is, I, I one th discussion that I missed in the book in, in your presentation too, what skin in the game do consultants have? And related to that also is the issue that um, um, most of these consultants, now one group that you, you didn't cover, you didn't cover the Beltway Bandits and the London Bandits, you only covered the big consulting firms. But if you think about it, there's a host of these firms in uh, Washington. I can name a few, they're in my book too, if you have a chance to, to look at it. There are hundreds of them who now live off aid. They do no other work except working with aid. It's a very cozy relationship that nobody talks about. And aid is, in a sense, that they are even one step further removed from us. You talk about it a little bit in your book, but it's not well developed, that they're even a step further. For example, in Pakistan, when these firms come here, they're like ghosts in the machine. We never even see them. They have huge contracts. Some of them are 100 million, 200 million, for example, Oxford Palace Policy Management has 25 million or 50 million, I think. Um, um, ASI, Adam Smith International, Cambridge. There's so many of them. I don't want to um, malign anyone, but there's so many of them who have hundreds of millions of dollars and they just sit there, finish their work. We don't even know what they do. They take from our aid money. Uh, there, are, uh, there are NGOs in this business to take, for example, International Food Policy Research Institute. It's a big NGO that is a basically a consulting firm that it, they've taken about $200 million of our money of grant money, which has gone to them. Um, then there are many universities involved in it too. For example, a very good firm that's from uh, Mariana's, um, uh, no, not Mariana, but they related my old school, LSC, Paul Collier, et cetera, have International Growth Center that has got a few hundred million pounds. And they've been around for 20 years. There's another one coming up, uh, the DFIT uh, CDO contract, Fragile States, that's got another hundred million dollars. So there's a whole industry out there and they come in here with no skin in the game to get the money. We can't even complain about them. If they fail, there's nothing we can do about them. And uh, talk about, if you talk about infantilizing the West, you can't imagine how infantilized we feel. So what happens is that we train a lot of people that do very well, and then we force them to leave the country. So this related issue of brain, brain, or terror human capital flight too. So some of our best people are sitting outside. The consultants were the worst people. I did a paper on this in 1998, uh, that were some of the worst people come here um, uh, from the consulting industry, but some of our best people leave. How do you react to that? Thank you so much. I mean, what fantastic questions. And I, I guess I wish on reflection, perhaps I should have made my um, slides kind of more, more focused to 
um, issues of quote unquote de developing countries, um, because I think this is all, 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 all countries that are outside of North America and, and Europe, because I think these issues that you have raised um, are certainly, you know, more acute. I'm doing, I have been doing my field work in Chile, which is, you know, technically a middle income country, but it's also one of the biggest um, kind of uh, 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 um, receivers of financial aid and technical assistance from European development banks, from the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and what, what I found there, for example, was that, or what I have found is that um, these organisations are in, in, in uh, actually in quite a similar way to how the IMF and the World Bank were mandating the use of consultancies to oversee structural adjustment programmes. We're seeing similar dynamics kind of still at play in um, kind of contemporary uh, provisions of financial and technical assistance in in many countries. So we focus. So, so this is kind of the the, the first the first issue. Um, is it, I guess does this? If I understand the kind of first part of your question right, um, this is to do with how these kind of uh, aid organisations. Um, are contracted not necessarily directly by the government, but also indirectly through um, development agencies and development no, banks. In fact, in fact, they're not contracted by the government. They're contracted yeah. by the development agencies, yeah. and really, they have no skin in the game, and we have no agency. We can't even correct them. We can't check them. We don't know. We can't even call it, comment on their work. They are contracted from outside. They come and do their work, whatever they like. They charge whatever they like. We don't get it. For example, we've seen USAID gave us, there's a thesis PhD thesis done by a kid. USAID gave us, uh, US gave us in the Kerry Luger bill, $7.5 billion. We received only a billion. The rest went to the consultants. Yes. No, this is, I mean, this is, I guess, perhaps even for, for, for many countries, this is even a, this is a bigger issue, right, than the consulting industry. I think many of the dynamics, and I can get the slide up again, the thing, the things that I'm looking at in my PhD, for example, I'm not just looking at outsourcing, actually, I'm also looking at how um, the kind of constant introduction and the bringing in one of the consequences of bringing in kind of quote unquote technical assistance um, or whatever for um, six months or three months contracts. These people who, you know, in terms of their interests, as you say, they don't have skin in the game, but they're also not staying in those organizations for very long. So the ability of organizations to build the kind of institutional knowledge, the kind of the, the kind of institutional knowledge that underpins capacity or should underpin capacity in a functioning bureaucracy or a functioning kind of government system um, is not there because the people who are kind of staffing or who are doing a lot of this work um, are kind of in or, in or out all the time. Of course, this then also has consequences, and I think this is what you've also just touched on, this also has consequences for the priorities, the prioritization of policies that um, kind of uh, emerge in a country. So to give you some, some uh, again, another example from my fieldwork in Chile, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, aid, there's a lot of development bank finance flowing into Chile at the moment because there is a hope that Chile will become the new source of green hydrogen for Latin America. Um, and, and this is then providing financing for um, kind of capacity in government um, for the green transition. Now, on its own, that's not a bad thing, but that means that a lot of kind of that that is kind of shifting the priorities of the the government of the elected government towards a particular goal um, in the green transition, which it might not have otherwise had. So, of course, where the money is put changes like what what the kind of capacity of the government or capacity of other organizations are so yeah it's not something that we write i think this could be a well and I, of course you've written extensively on this as well um this could be our whole book in itself we focus on these sectors we focus on this this sector in particular because it hasn't been um discussed as much yet but i i am you know i'm i certainly think many of the dynamics that we're concerned about apply and are probably much more important in the cases or the issues they've discussed. Very good, Rosie. Another couple of thoughts that I just might um, put before you, please tell Mariana and yourself, please do a book on technical assistance. We don't know what technical assistance is. And we've had technical assistance for 75 years and we have seen our capacity decrease. 
Exactly. And I don't know yeah. how long this technical assistance will go on. Will it go on for another thousand years? Or does it ever finish? Do we ever grow up? Do we, the children, ever grow up? Or do we always remain children? So I think that's one book that you should do. And related to the technical assistance issue that I wrote about a long time ago, which is well worth thinking about, at least to me it is. To me, it's very important, but the rest of the profession doesn't, which is that the technical assistance, as it comes in, it, it generates a brain drain. So people go out rather than stay inside the country. They're not used. But uh, Rosie, I'd just like to point another thought, point you in another direction too, which I think will requires people like you to tell us. I think yeah. where economics has failed and where everybody's failed, and Mariana has kind of hit, hit upon it a little bit, but we still don't have any idea. We keep talking about the market versus government debate, and we keep talking about um, you know, how the market is killing them. I mean, it's always um, us versus them, or markets versus government. But quite frankly, where all of us have failed is that we really don't have a good theory of governance and that we are kind of stabbing at government to do everything that we wish it should do. Whereas we know that it doesn't have the capacity to do a small amount of things that it should. So how, how do you react to the fact that um, what is probably needed is a theory of government and how to make government work, which as you rightly criticized, new public management doesn't do, but we need some theory or some idea on how to make government work. Yeah, I agree with you, government has a large role, but how, how should it perform that role? So this, you know, lot, I guess lots of people have, have, have written on this and I'm, I'm sure that, you, that, you know, what, well, I know that what you've written on, on some of this work as well is, is very rich and I would encourage everyone else to go and look at Professor Hack's um, um, work and, and, and writing because it's, it's kind of hugely informative. Um, I would suggest, and this is kind of conclusions that I'm coming to, I'm, I'm, I, I paused my PhD to work on the book, so I'm still writing my PhD, I'll be finishing it within a year or so, but the conclusions that I'm coming, coming to um, uh, in my PhD kind of call on us to think about governments and this maybe sounds a bit fluffy I'm not going I'm not going to have time to explain it very well but to think about government organizations as dynamic and, and inherently embedded and if we do that and we think about the kind of knowledge and capacity the governments require resources that's a big thing right Go governments require, require require resources to do to be able to do things but also to be able to develop capacity to be able to adapt capacity as the kind of wider political social economic corporate context changes within which government is based um so so I, I i would suggest we kind of we need to think about governments both in terms of how much resources they have and of course um many governments around the world are very fiscally constrained or they do not have um kind of resources there are you know and, and, and I'm, I'm not kind of stepping over issues with kind of dem democratic accountability that certainly exists in many countries including my own if you've if you've if anyone has been following uh uh, UK politics during the pandemic, you'll know that we had a number of these quote unquote corruption um, issues where um, politicians were handing uh, uh, contracts for things to that to people who they knew in business and this sort of thing. This is an issue. That's not what I'm focusing on. Um, but but it is it is really significant. So so governments need money. That's a big thing. Governments also need the ability to develop capacity and often in, in a direction that they are democratically mandated to, to develop it. So that requires the ability of governments to maintain these routines, to maintain the kind of organizational institutional knowledge that they have, because that becomes, and this is particularly the case in fiscally constrained countries, that becomes the resource that they are then able to use when they need to adapt capacity to respond to new needs. So, so this is kind of the, the big picture of why, why the, a kind of government by technical assistance or government by consultancy doesn't work because it undermines the ability of that government to develop capacity that is required to adapt in, in, in and, and kind of provide the services and things that citizens want of it um, in the future. I am a public policy and governance uh, student with uh, PAID. Uh, my, I have uh, two small questions. One, uh, that uh, what is uh, the key motive uh, if this consulting is like uh, that much constrained an activity and if uh, it has this much of repercussions on the overall capacity of the governmental organizations, then, I mean, why do governments hire consultants at the first place? Two, uh, we have seen in the most 
uh, recent years that uh, there is a lot that the consulting companies have brought into practice, like for example, <clears throat> digitalization, industry four, and everything like that. So if this practice oriented knowledge is not brought in by these consulting companies, and if it is not actually infused into any kind of organizations, including the government, then how can the governmental organizations develop themselves and how can they get capacitated in terms of, in order to uh, okay. discharge responsibilities for which they are mandated? Let Rosie, let Rosie answer that, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll focus on so, so the the kind of second part of your question. Um, we do provide lots of examples of of things that have gone well when governments have tried to rebuild capacity. I think you know making sure that we're looking at this or thinking about this also in the kind of broader structural, financial, economic context, as Professor Hack has, has also um, um, uh, kind of alluded to. This does require probably a broader systemic change, rethinking how. Um, countries receive finance and, and, and how they're able to use finance. Um, but but in terms of um, the, the question of why governments use them in the first place, um, we can look at, the, you know, this is why we situate it within the kind of broader transformation of gov governments and the transition or the evolution of the idea, which is now dominant uh, in many countries, that governments are, are uninnovative, that they do not create value for economies and societies, and that they should get out of the way as much as possible. Um, governments then feel it's, it's not just that, um, you know, consultancies are um, pushing services on governments, but governments and civil services themselves then feel that they do not have the capacity, the capabilities to be able to deliver the policies that uh, politicians are elected to to implement and therefore um, will contract consultancies. Of course, as we've also discussed, there can also be um, issues of legitimation and blame avoidance. So if a politician perhaps wants to introduce something that is controversial or if, uh, 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 or if it wants to um, uh, 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 pursue something that is potentially risky, then it might contract a consultancy to um, to in theory uh, kind of take the blame if that goes wrong we do also see cases of politicians and policymakers contracting um consultancies to help provide kind of legitimacy to strengthen their case in an internal political um uh, kind of struggle that they might have with perhaps another agency or another politician. We see that in business as well, where business executives um, will contract consultancies to help legitimate their position. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rosie, for this uh, wonderful lecture. It, it's a very important topic. So a few uh, quick observations um, and my own thoughts on this issue. Uh, uh, my thoughts are more in line with uh, the how, how does or how do, do the inst consultancy firms or uh, institutions like International Monetary Fund or World Bank, they are able to push those ideas or consultancies upon uh, countries like Pakistan. And uh, I want to speak on that. I'm sure you've touched it on the book, uh, in your book, but I uh, just want a few observations. I want to forward a few observations. First of all, uh, in case of Pakistan, I can speak of Pakistan. Uh, there is the structure of the economy. Uh, you have this structure of the economy where we uh, a lot of there is a lot of dependency upon imports. So when you get into a, when we get into trouble and we require loans, so that creates that void that space from where other people or the loan giving organizations could come in. Then you have uh, policy failures at home. One big policy failure that I can point out over here uh, related very much to the discussion. Uh, is the intellectual void. We have over 200 universities, I think 220 universities, and the stuff coming out of those universities is uh, below par, below average. Uh, so it's a domestic policy failure. It creates that void uh, from where, and that void is then filled by others coming from outside. So you have other organizations who are coming and say, look, you can't do this, so let's hire some consultant who will come in and guide you. And the third point, uh, uh, qu just quickly, you uh, mentioned capacity building. Now, that's a pretty uh, big buzzword in Pakistan, especially in bureaucracy. That's uh, And they love it. Uh, tell them that you want to build their capacity and they'll uh, welcome you with open arms because that means a foreign trip to them. Nothing more, right? They'd, be, uh, they'd have a foreign trip over there. And uh, they've evolved over time. Bureaucracy has evolved over time. They love their capacity building thing. 
but it's just a ruse for a uh, foreign trip, nothing more. Thank you. Thank you. I, I mean, I've, it's really great. I kind of wish that we had longer because it's really nice to hear or really interesting for me also. You know, I'm, I'm a student, so I'm still learning, even though I've written, I, I, I took time out of my uh, PhD to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to write the book. Um, but it's very interesting and, 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 and fascinating to hear kind of how this applies in other cases and other issues. Um, I'm going to just pick up on the, uh, you know, I think I think you're completely right that um, of course, when there are gaps, when there are, I guess, um, ideological, perhaps, or ideational gaps um, uh, uh, in, in kind of our understanding of how the economy works, this is what creates the vacuum that allows ideas um, that, you know, maybe, and, and, and not just ideas, but the kind of promotion and implementation of particular policies and reforms, when there is kind of a, a vacuum of alternatives, that, that can be a factor in this. Um, I did want to pick up on this issue of capacity building, because obviously I use the term all the time, it's something we use in academia, but of course you're right that it it is just, com it's complete jargon in, um, in you know, development circles. Um, but that's not to say that capacity building in itself is not inherently valuable. The problem is the um, ideas about what constitutes capacity building and how capacity is built um are, are 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 pretty weak you know the kind of dominant ideas about how so like you know it, it, uh, in 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 development circles capacity building requires technical assistance it requires you know these kind of beha behaviorist learning relationships that happen between for example civil servants in pakistan and and other parts of the world but actually when we have a different lens and we think about government and we think about what capacity actually is, how capabilities develop over time, um, uh, 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 in in a slightly different way, in the ways that I've discussed here, then we will we will see that this kind of this these assumptions underpinning how this kind of capacity is built um, that underpins this whole kind of buzzword of capacity building um, kind of fall on their foundations. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work in that way. So I guess. Um, if we recognize that it's a it's a it's a buzzword we can also use that to an advantage right but we have to challenge the um uh, but because that's how you know it, you know it can be useful for speaking it can be useful to speak the language of um or to be able to speak the language of development agencies and and all the rest of it um but we have to challenge the assumptions on which um their kind of capacity building uh, agenda is or, or a, a capacity building agenda is based. Uh, thank you, Rosie, for your wonderful presentation. My question is, we need to define what is capacity building? Mm. For instance, for most of the financial institutions, the capacity building is they just hire a good researcher, international researchers, and they just develop a software and they uh, come to our, uh, you know, bureaucrats and they just teach them how to use the software. So this is the capacity building. It's, it's, okay. it's, so where is the intellectual capacity building? We don't see much of the intellectual capacity building. So is it possible how, how we can frame it in the research work? In, in your context how is how is it possible thank you yeah so i think it's a, again a great a great point and and you know this will be i guess a point of reflection that i'll take from from this as well to be a bit more clear about what i mean i think um when we look at it from the i, I think the insights that we have from evolutionary economics also attest to the importance of organizations um and uh, uh, in collective learning and in, in shaping collective capacity so you know many of these ideas are based around quite uh, the kind of dominant ideas around capacity building um, are underpinned by behaviorist theories of knowledge and capacity but what evolutionary what the evolutionary economics lens and you know going kind of I guess further back also kind of Marxian ideas about capacity and labor and, ha and, and how this constitutes um, kind of a, 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 a resource. What all of this attests to is that this process of developing capacity is collective. It requires interaction between people within organizations or across organizational boundaries. Um, so I think these these kind of theoretical lenses which by the way haven't really been applied to looking at government much before which is what again what I, i'm trying to do in my phd but have been developed very well for looking at firm for, uh, for looking at firms and industrial organization um can provide us with a challenge to the you know behaviorist ideas about what capacity is that underpin a lot of 
capacity building ideas and, and development. Very quickly, Rosie, thank you very much. Um, I'll just say one thing half in jest, that there was a book called The Economic, sorry, Diary of an Economic Hitman. Yes. We talked about how debt was used a vehicle. Maybe there's a counterpart book that you can also do, how consulting, technical assistance, capacity building, all these terms that mean very little, also are a part of the neo-colonial neo -colonial enterprise to keep us in our place. And it's mm. very successful, it's very successful. I'm, I can tell you when you have the time, Pakistan has not made a single policy for itself in the last 30, 40 years. All the policies have been made by consultants and the international agencies. And each one has failed, even their own evaluation, they say they failed, but we have suffered the consequences and we keep suffering the consequences. So thank you very much for at least raising the issue. We are very grateful to you. And we are very grateful for you to, for you, to you to come and give us your time as well. Tell Mariana we should also expect her to come sometimes come and talk to the poor. I, yeah, I, I, I'm sure that she absolutely. Mariana's calendar, as you can imagine, is completely sure. bonkers. So I please, sure. if, if if you would like to send an invitation, then then please pa pass it my no, way. We've sent, we've sent her. We've sent her many invitations. Oh no! Some okay. friends have also talked to her, but do tell her that anytime we would love to host her. Thank you. In fact, Thank we'd love both much. of you to come to Pakistan too. We'll bring you over sometime. All the best, Rosie. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Bye.